So Javier is a very hard act to follow, so I'm going to answer this question, then you don't have to vote for it, and I won't feel bad. So the answer is yes, we need math. And so what I want to do is spend the next 10 minutes convincing you guys, oh, he didn't start my clock, I get extra time. Okay, so what I want to convince you is that we have microscopes, we have telescopes, we have computers, we have detectors, yet we still need math. And yes, this is the math that you learned in elementary school and high school and dot, 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 and I want to try and convince you that it's important. Okay. Math in the context of a supernova. Since Jeff got to talk about the origin of a word, I get to talk about the origin of a word. So supernova is super plus nova. Nova meant new star. We looked up in the sky, there's something bright there we didn't see before. Aha, it's a new star. It's a nova. Well, then there's one that's even brighter. It's a supernova. And you don't actually have to travel that far out in space to see one. In fact, does anybody recognize where this is? OK. <laughs> so there is, or well, excuse me, there was a supernova in Oakland. This is the, if you are getting on 580, from, uh, I think you're on Lake Park, Passing Grand, there was a billboard up there. And if you know scientists, we all love to get published. We want to see our names in print. But seeing your picture on a billboard is way cooler. This picture up here is of a supernova. It's before an explosion. And it was made with a code that we wrote at Berkeley Lab. So that's the supernova in Oakland. Uh, unfortunately, they took it down. <laughs> so this is what one usually thinks of as a supernova. And this is in a galaxy far, far away, in fact, about 60 million light years away. And this picture, it's a classic picture. If you go on Google, you will see that everyone puts up this picture of a supernova. It's SN 1994D, so you can guess what year it was discovered. And the three things you need to know. So one is we don't see them usually by looking up in the sky. This one's actually an image through the Hubble telescope. Two is, and I don't have a pointer, if you look in the middle of the picture, that's a galaxy. A galaxy is many, many, many stars. You look at the bottom left, that is one star. So a supernova has the ability during its lifetime to be as bright as an entire galaxy. So that's a pretty amazing thing. And then the third thing about them is they're only visible for several weeks, kind of like my billboard. Okay. <laughs> so why do I care? And I have to say that Kai stole a little bit of the thunder because he used the word supernova. And if you remember what he said about them, he said, that's where all the heavy elements came from. So in the Big Bang, in the beginning, we had hydrogen, we had helium. We didn't have all these other elements that we have that Berkeley Lab discovered some of. And so all of these other elements came from supernovae. So if you ever hear the expression, you're made of stardust, it's real. That's what we're all made of. So here is a brief history as to why you should care about supernovae. So if we look back 1915, 100 years ago, Einstein said the universe is stationary. Oh, he used the word universe, too. You killed all my, uh, all my punches. So the universe is stationary. The universe is space. It's the stuff that surrounds us. It's not getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. That seems pretty reasonable. We're here. We've been here. We're going to be here. Well, Hubble came along. He had some telescopes. He observed galaxies. And he observed that all galaxies are getting farther and farther away from all other galaxies. And there's only one way for that to happen. It's not just that something's leaving me but I'm getting closer to something else. Everything's getting farther away. And the only way that happens is if the universe itself is expanding. So we started the Big Bang. We're getting bigger. This sounds great. OK. Einstein actually admitted he'd been wrong, which I, I love because everyone thinks Einstein is the god. He was a really, really smart guy. He was wrong. He admitted it. We move on. That is a great way to do science. OK, so now, looking at more galaxies, one of the things they noticed, you can look at the rotation rate. So galaxies spin. They don't just sit there. And just the same way, if you look at the Earth going around the sun, if you know how far it is from the sun and you know how fast it's going around the sun, you can find, you can calculate the mass of the sun. Same thing with the galaxies. Galaxies spin. They rotate around other things. If you look at how fast they are, how far away they are, you can figure out how much mass is in the middle. And the problem is that there's a lot more mass in the middle than we can account for by adding up all the things that we can see. So what that tells us is there's a whole lot of mass out there. There's a whole lot of matter. So mass is matter. Dark means we don't know what it is. OK, that was the first thing I learned was, what, what is, what's the secret? What's dark matter? Dark is we don't know. OK, so now if you like to worry, and I come from a family of worriers, you say, wait a minute, mass is gravitationally attracted. Mass always attracts. If there's a whole lot of mass, maybe it's going to suck the universe back in. We started in the Big Bang. We're headed for the big crunch. So if you want to stay up at night, you can worry about it for about two seconds until I tell you, no, you don't need to worry. You can go home and sleep tonight. 
1998, science breakthrough of the year. This is actually Science Magazine. This was on the cover. You can see the expanding bubble that Einstein's blowing out of his pipe. How did they figure this out? They said, well, we've observed a bunch of type 1a supernovae. We're going to make some assumptions about how they behave. And we are going to conclude that the rate of the universe expanding is increasing. So not only is the universe getting bigger, it's getting bigger faster and faster. OK, so now you can sleep at night. This is good. I haven't said math yet, so, so what's going on here? So it's this middle part that bothers me. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a computational scientist. I'm not an astrophysicist. So everything that I've told you I had to learn not that long ago. And I said, well, these scientists, they must know what they're talking about. Well, whenever you see the word assumptions, you say, OK, what did they assume? We'll talk about that. So let's talk about how do we know what supernovae do? If we're going to make these assumptions about how they blow up, how do we do that? OK, so you observe them. Well, you observe them. Here's the Hubble telescope. We talked about that. And what you see is only the light from the supernova that hits the Earth. It's the observables. It's what you can observe. This picture, on the left, you can see a, a star that is, is dark, and then it gets bright, and then it gets dark again. Upper corner is just tracing out how bright it is. And then the lower part is telling you that we actually measure in different colors. We don't just measure white light. We measure in different colors. That's what you observe. So how do you study a supernova? You can't get up close and personal. You can't send a probe into a supernova. And this is the three pillars of science, or the three rings, kind of Olympics looking. Experimental slash observational, theoretical, think pencil and paper, computational. So we have computers. This is great. I still haven't said math. So here's the point. We're going to use computation. OK, so we have computers. End of story. And here's where it comes in. What's a star? OK, we've got to put a star on a computer. And a star is a fluid. Okay? Water is a fluid. Air is a fluid. So we can use the equations of fluid dynamics to model a star. OK, this is great. Whoops. Fluid dynamics describes three things. It tells you how the fluid moves. It tells you you pour the glass of water. Water goes from the glass onto the floor if I'm pouring. It tells you nuclear burning. This is how elements become other elements. That's how hydrogen and helium became all these other things, how carbon and oxygen became magnesium. And fluid dynamics tells you sound waves. So sound waves are the reason that you can hear me now. If there were no sound waves traveling in the air for me to you, you would not hear me. The equations of fluid dynamics do all three of these things. So we have a supercomputer. I think we even have one of these pictures. These are supercomputers that are actually at Berkeley Lab. If you put these all in a supercomputer and you use all the processors you've got and all the best techniques you've got, you can model an explosion for about two seconds. And that's just the explosion itself. And the problem is, if you ever study fires, like house fires, forest fires, any kind of fire, the outcome of the fire often depends on where it started, where and how. In the two seconds, you can't get there. So we need about two hours. And it turns out that those equations I showed you, we can't do it. We can't use those equations and do more than about two seconds. So finally, I get to my punchline. We need math. Okay? We want to figure out how the supernova starts, which is going to tell me how it blows up, which is going to tell me whether it really is the same as all the other supernovae. We need math. And it turns out, and this is the part I'm skipping over, if you take out the sound waves, it's, you can solve it a lot faster. And the point is, if I were holding a match up here and somebody asked a question, it doesn't change the burning of the match. We can neglect the sound waves. And so we use our math dot, dot, dot to say, let's come up with some equations that don't have sound waves. And you guys had probably already figured out that this is what they would look like. So this is what they would look like. <laughs> and it turns out that computationally, we can solve these a lot faster. We know how to do that. And so now, we can do the full two hours. And let me just see if I can get the movie to start again. So here we have this is the nucleosynthesis in an exploding star. This one happens to have ignited at the very center. Not all of them do. And so I'm a computational scientist. I love this. I love that we made progress. I won't say solved, but we made progress on the supernova problem. But what's really fun for me is we can use those same ideas. We can use those same mathematical techniques, those same ideas, and actually those same computational skills. This is cloud formation. This is rising air. It's moist air. This is liquid water. We just made a cloud. We can use the same techniques to model a burner in a laboratory. So we have colleagues in a different building. They actually burn things. We put it on a computer. We match it up. 
and it's surprising what we learn. And that, to me, is the power of math. Thank you.